LRXC is one of the most impressive rising stars in the PokeTube world. I first met LRXC long ago, back when he focused mostly on Gen 3 1v1, a metagame that he helped to pioneer. But now he has made a name for himself, breaking one of Pokemon Emerald's longest standing records, with a win streak of 119 in the Battle Factory. This took many attempts and hours upon hours of grinding and strategizing. LRXC's entertaining personality, infectious enthusiasm for Pokemon, and undeniable skill when tackling some of these tough challenges have led to... I just realized what I wrote doesn't make grammatical sense. <laughs> <laughs> also, just so that you don't get a bunch of comments flaming, the record is 155. I believe. Um, the video ended at 119, but... Oh, sorry. Wasn't there some situation where the, the VOD got cut off and you had no evidence for a bit that you did the record and someone had to recover it? That was like just for like one part of it, but the vid a lot of the video ended at 119, but that's just because that was the record and it was just me getting one Oh, more and you win. went further. Of yeah, course. I went further because I was, I was going to make a part two, but yeah, I never did. So I didn't uh, remember all the nitty yeah. gritty of that, but congratulations on that once again. Dude, this intro sounds great. I feel like I'm about to get like a prize at a high school or something like that. Valedictorian. <laughs> anyway, LRXC, thank you for coming. How are you? It's been a while since we last had a chat. It has. Um, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, YouTube's going well. Back at college, doing all that stuff, easing back into the, the groove of things. But uh, yeah. I'm doing well. Gen 3 is doing well. Well, thank you for taking the time to chat today. It's been awesome seeing your pivot into more successful Pokemon content. It's been a wild ride, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. I mean, uh, you know, under what, 1K subs for like three years, uploading random videos, and then all of a sudden, boom, explosion. I'm uh, almost at 20K. So yeah, it's exciting stuff. And I've watched every moment of it almost. <laughs> yeah. <It's> <laughs> Yeah, Jim Cool is officially an OG. I forgot to introduce the, the podcast itself, by the way. This is The Fridge, a new interview series from Jim. What do you think of that name, The Fridge? Well, my mascot's a cold Pokemon, right? The Fridge is cold. I mean, I have to... I'm Jimothy Cool. It's cool in the fridge. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. It's so little cute. And the little, the little fridge guy. Oh my gosh. What should we it's name just, that guy? It's just... Freddy Fridge. Yeah, Freddy's easy, right? Because like it has the alliteration of like F R D and Fridge. Yeah, something like that. Maybe there's like a, a, a like a human sounding name that's something cold. Coolio. Like Cole. I don't know. Cool <laughs> that is a we might get a cease and desist from Coolio if we do that. Yeah. Yeah, Jimmy the Coolio. We'll <laughs> we'll think about it. Freddy Fridge this feels too obvious, but we'll... maybe Freddy Fridge is fine. Honestly, it's a bit funny. I like it. So you're someone who's a bit of a Pokemon contrarian, I would describe you as. Whatever's like popular in the space, you kind of do the opposite and you make up your own stuff. Like Gen 3 1v1 is kind of a, something you made up and turned into a format. And even Emerald Battle Factory is a bit out of left field. Most people would do a Nuzlocke challenge or other such things. What draws yeah. you to so many of these weird areas of, of Pokemon? Well, I feel like, you know, some people kind of feed off of like finding new things to explore. And I'm a person who I, I like the idea of being one of the first people to kind of like really deep dive into something or look into something, you know, like, I don't know, some of like the coolest YouTube videos are when like big YouTubers explore like super niche topics that you'd like never have even considered. And uh, yeah, I think that's what kind of draws me towards those sort of things. That's true. There's nothing quite like when like a new meta game comes out and it's just the Wild West and you're just figuring stuff out. Yeah, and it's really cool yeah. when you're the first person to like pioneer something new and yeah, fresh. Yeah, it is. It is. Not that I pioneered Battle Factory like it's been there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you pushed it though, for sure. Yeah. That nobody was doing any sort of Battle Factory content ever unless, like, there, I mean, that there just wasn't. Nobody was doing it. It's crazy to see that the meteoric rise of that. I guess it's an appealing idea because your streams at some points while you were on that world record run were getting a huge amount of attention, like kind of ridiculous, more than a lot of established streamers that I've watched for years. You were outdoing them in some of those. Was that like yeah. a little overwhelming, the very sudden spike? Like, it seems crazy. Yeah, it was definitely surreal because like I had that this one video, not the world record video, but that that round 16 video that really like blew, blew up. And so then I switched to YouTube because I was like, well, I got to capitalize on this streaming wise. And then bam, 400 live viewers consistently watching my first live stream. And it was just kind of like, a, yeah, it was it was definitely huge because before on Twitch, it was like 
10 viewer streams and then all of a sudden 400 yeah it was definitely uh it was definitely it was definitely overwhelming like considering like oh should i go for it on youtube should i like how do i capitalize on this like what does this mean or like yeah it was uh it was really cool i wasn't stressed out by it initially but it was really cool i think that's like a perfect example also of videos feeding into streams in this healthy way where there's like an ongoing storyline yes the people yeah. who watch the videos get directly referred to the, the streams because it's the same yep thing it was like a perfect storm it really was and it was because it was because i got to commentate on adv revival oh, and yeah. you know <laughs> you you linked my channel in the description or the comment or whatever people are clicking on my channel because they like the narration and what do you do when you look at a channel you go to their most recent video because my video was only only had like 800 views for like a week or like a week and a half and then all of a sudden a lot of people clicked on it and it was just enough to hit the algorithm and I got like 60k views in a weekend. It was un unreal, unprecedented. Yeah, I forgot about the ADV revival element of that. Yeah. I don't know how much credit I could take. Sometimes videos do just randomly go to the moon. It, the algorithm is mysterious. It was definitely a part of it because like, you know, people would comment like, love your energy in ADV revival and I'm loving oh, this yeah. too. Yeah, it was, uh, it definitely fed into it, which was like awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have a little role in that then. That's cool. Definitely, definitely. And how have you been enjoying, I mean, we talk off camera a lot about YouTube and the sort of the strategic side of it. How have you been enjoying like this new opportunity of being a YouTuber, I suppose? And you got any plans for the channel? I know you've been up in the air about what to do moving forward because the Battle Factory thing, maybe that chapter is closed for now and there's new stuff to be done. So I was, I dropped out of college for one semester and simultaneously blew up on YouTube. So yeah, then I was streaming all the time. Um, wasn't really uploading that many videos. And uh, yeah, it was just kind of a, once, once I got back to college, I was finally, I feel like able to really step back and be like, oh, like I'm kind of like a YouTuber YouTuber now. And uh, like, it really, you know, there's all these different pressures that I never had to like think about before. Like, you know, before I would just like get into whatever I wanted to, I never thought about, you know, like money or views or anything. It was just kind of like whatever I wanted to do. But then all of a sudden it was kind of like, there's like a standard to kind of like uphold. I felt like I had to like do something specific so more people would watch. And it just, it kind of made me, it made me think about like why I do the things I do in a different way. And I, yeah, I kind of made a decision where I was like, you know, I'm not really gonna like go for it go for it on youtube i'm just gonna you know keep doing what i normally would have been doing if i had 200 subs or if i had 20k so uh yeah yeah, I think that's that's admirable in its own way. When your your hobby and your passion becomes your job, and it, the magic can sometimes be lost in translation there. Yeah. So it's good to just put your foot down and say like, I'm going to keep this as a hobby first and foremost. And if this stuff gets views or it does well, it's that's secondary. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely had a bit of a crisis with that myself. I mean, Pokemon was my main hobby in the past, and it's a little bit hard to juggle, like, you know, playing Pokemon showdown tournaments and making all these videos. I started to notice I was at one point making multiple videos a week and trying to compete. And I'm Australian, so sometimes you gotta play at awkward times, like 3 a.m. or something, because there's just no other time where you guys line up. It was hard to put effort into the competitive side, where before I would theory craft for hours and like practice a lot on the ladder, prepare yeah. for my opponents, but I didn't have as much time to do that anymore and it's kind of like saying goodbye to this this hobby i just had to accept that yeah. i simply don't have the time anymore i've got more yeah. important things to do that's like it I, I remember like kind of seeing that happen where like you know i know like you got like invited to uh, cal's invitational but then you're also like pumping out these gen 9 videos and like you were able to kind of do that balance a bit you know i have like these different video ideas about different battle frontier stuff or like you know sometimes i want to get into random gen 3 meta games because i know that they could do well for views or like you know create different content but like right now I'm doing like blindfolded battle factory and I'm just really into that concept of like, you know, doing stuff blindfolded, which is really interesting. And I just, I just know that 
I couldn't do that job wise. But yeah, that must be tough to kind of be like, not necessarily like estranging yourself from like the Gen 3 community, like you're jib cool now. <laughs> yeah, I guess I've accepted that. You know, it's like a new role that I have as this content guy. I'm able to showcase metagames people don't know about and help the community yeah. in that way and help with the promoting the tournament and all that. And that's fun giving the players something that I would have liked to have as a player. I'm almost jealous of some of the competitors that get to have the, all this cool new attention on Gen 3. I don't have as much time to actually play the same way I used to, but it's it's fun to promote the metagame I love. And I, I can still play, of course, like yeah. the streams, try to do some gaming. Using random mons, yeah, like Muck and like uh, Arvok. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it is interesting people view me as the guy who uses stupid Pokemon. That's not how I was when I was an actual tournament no, competitor. Weren't. I was more serious. No, you did bring that. I remember you were like kicking yourself for bringing that. Uh, what did you bring to play-ins? It was like a Porygon 2 Suicune kind of team. Might have had like an Umbreon on it. I remember like you said you got too cute with like a team that you brought in. A... That was a weird. It was up against Arctic Breeze. And I yeah, brought a yeah. uh, this Umbreon weird umbreon team and it looked bizarre but it was kind of, i thought it was okay and i went i went up against the thing is that i had never used foratress once in a tournament before so i was like i'm gonna bring foratress <laughs> as a surprise and then arctic brought yeah. i don't know why he brought hp fire foratress which is a hard counter <laughs> to enemy fortress. I'm like, why would you bring that, man? I've never brought yeah, fortress in my crazy. life. And it just, it that, just that's, soloed that's me. That's absurd. And then yeah. it, it was kind of annoying because everyone <laughs> in the chat was like, this team is crap from Jim. What does he do? I'm like, I'm kind of counter team yeah. here, man. Like, it's props to you, though. I mean, Arctic is a game and he did destroy me in all the other games as well. But that first uh, game, I was I was a little like uh, in the Twilight Zone. Like, how did this guy bring HP fight? Did he? Yeah. That's that's did he crazy. hack into my computer? Like, how did he uh, know? I don't, I don't know, but yeah, I just remember. I don't know who commentated that on CI, but like, I just remember them like just like ragging on the team and stuff like that. And I was just like, no, because I because you were you were if you want you were at the end of the like you know magma or aqua bracket or something like that. Because who did you bought you beat Mead, right? Didn't you beat Mead? I had a or, good like, run. I, I beat Mead, yeah, and then I, I beat I, Cyber Odin. And I yes, lost to uh, Pack. Yeah. And then I randomly yeah. got another chance because someone dropped out. So me and yep, Arctic, who yeah. were the two finalists, got to play. And hey, but you know what? If Arctic didn't win, we wouldn't have gotten to see the uh, the, the tail with Blissey <laughs> as well. And the tail with Blissey. <laughs> so that was a good. That was a better timeline. Oh I would have just lost God. to H Clot round one or something. <laughs> yeah, dude, tail with Blissey. That was like I I I got to see the curse Gengar live. Was, I don't. Was that the same year? That was the same year. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that was he the was. Same he year. went crazy in that tournament. He was oh, <laughs> pioneering. That was beautiful. I'm actually. I'm glad that happened. He's one of my favorite builders. He just brings in wacky stuff. It's awesome. Easily him and my favorite, who's kind of under the radar a little bit. Pokology is easily one of my favorite players of all time. That that dude is legendary. Like nobody can get away with the team builds that he does. I like. I just. He just. He lives in another world of Gen Three but also simultaneously just like wins games. I don't know, I love it. He always destroys me too with like some random crap. He had to, what was it, skill swap uh, Banette with Insomnia, skill swapped onto my Suicune <laughs> so I couldn't rest. And then he rested with the Insomnia Banette because he lost Insomnia, gave it to me, switched out back in and it healed the sleep. I was like, yeah, what the hell is wrong with you, uh, man? And like when he, uh, I don't know if you remember in like a uh, Hoenn Gaiden, uh, he just ran through one of the tours because like he just thrives in places. I don't know. He just thrives in those scenarios where yeah, and Hoenn got in the random niche mons are no longer bad. They're actually good. So it's like a huge buff to him because he's a professional <laughs> at cooking up some he nonsense, is. which and and what I love is that I feel like I wish I was a little sometimes I wish I was a little as like a when I was doing competitive or just a player. He seems like the kind of person that wants to win, but doesn't like get nervous, doesn't get like caught up with metagame trends or what has to be good or has to be this. Like he just enjoys playing Pokemon. That's just something that I really respect in like a I don't know, like a pure way, if that makes sense. Yeah, and he's very impressive considering that he doesn't have as much like consistency as results as some of the top players, but like everyone respects him. He's got that level 
people yeah, of respect. I, mean, he's I guess he's a uh, gatekeeper for skill. Like you, you like you, you're not just gonna like beat him if you know just starting in Gen three. Like he'll he'll smack you around. I mean like and in the eighty VPL, didn't he go like undefeated during the regular season like uh, last yeah. year or and something I think, like that? Or was it Mishi? I don't something. Love that guy. I wanted to make a video on him actually. I wanted to make a video of like my favorite Gen three player ever. But and I might get back to that idea. But then the the replay purge happened where like all of those replays were lost and so like oh that sucks footage, yeah. would, footage would just be annoying i guess but yeah i think anyway. they will come back though i think th i saw a tweet about it they're, they're working on recovering those the tournament ones came back the smog tours yeah but everything out like every other like kind of niche or like random meta game are just like gone that was an issue when i was doing my iceberg video i couldn't find much footage of adv 200 the old meta game because ah, a lot yeah. of the replays would would delete it and like nobody thinks to download them like because like why would you i mean like yeah. but now it's like <laughs> what do you think your favorite pokemon meta game is so like i think the obvious answer used to be gen 3 1v1 right but like that meta game has kind of gotten you know pretty stale which is understandable kind of solved ish i think historically I think it would have been Gen 3 1v1. It's got it's got to be it's got to be ADVOU, honestly. Just like from a spectator's point of view, playing in a bit, like it's got it's just it's got to be ADVOU. I think that has to be my favorite. But like the one that I have the strongest connection with is definitely like a Gen 3 1v1 and especially what it was, but uh, It's the easy answer, but it's it's damn true, folks. It's damn it's true. Stuff. In your in your video that went to the moon, the world record video, Point Crow has a little as a little feature. How did you get into contact <laughs> with him? Did he, uh, he's a famous fellow. Is he, was he a fan? Did he stumble upon some of your content? Yeah, so there was this crazy moment where this is when I was pushing the world record. I had like 130, 140 wins at some point. And you know, this like, you know, really cool moment happened. And all of a sudden I see in the chat, Point Crow is just like, let's go. And I'm just like, what? Like he's there. And I don't know if you know who Jarvis Johnson is. He was also there. And it was just like this crazy, moment right so then like a couple days later uh i saw like point crow on twitch so i was like watching his stream and then i said something then all of a sudden he like just stops and he's just like oh my gosh elric c is here you know my ego through the roof of course he's <laughs> like dude i've loved watching your streams this this that and then his manager abby bagel comes into the stream and is like elric c we love watching your stuff so much this this that like they're literally fanboying over me and i'm just like what in the world is happening so then and then i kind of got the idea because i was working on the video on the time and i was just like oh what if i like i bet point crow would maybe want to like cameo i think like he'd think that's fun so i reached out to his manager and she's like oh i'll talk to him so then two weeks later, no response. And I was just like, I, I mean, that's okay, right? Then all of a sudden, uh, friend request from Point Crow on Discord. I'm like, oh yeah, we are in. And like he said, he's an awesome dude. We were talking about like, you know, what I kind of want, his ideas for the little cameo. Um, and yeah, it was awesome. And uh, that was that, yeah. Nice little uh, Point Crow jump scare during the video. And I still, I still like watching his stuff. Like I was just watching him uh, route uh, blindfolded tears of the kingdom which is like such a sick concept but uh yeah that's how that went down so <laughs> i guess you're in the same class of elite game are you both blindfolded doing these impossible tasks can't imagine <laughs> such a thing that's awesome though it's it's some of my favorite youtubers have like watched my videos before and said that they like them and it, it's a little bit bizarre it's like surreal to be honest it is it's an it's an awesome it's such a of course it's a little bit of like a clout thing but like on on a real level it is cool to just like see like really large youtubers like you know or like even streamers like Conrad's pants or like patters or like just people that are big people that would like comment on my video and just be like hey this video was really cool i liked watching it like that's just cool stuff i don't know that that's just like it's pretty like, amazing oh, they know me yeah yeah and like chess.com on your video Bro, i don't know what's <laughs> up with that someone on the chess.com social media team is just a fan of mine i guess because chess.com yeah the YouTube channel keeps commenting on my videos and they're like <laughs> coming to my streams too. I know. It's That's like, so what's chess.com doing in here, man? It's kind of like, it's kind of like a nice reminder that like big YouTubers or like people on big companies, like they're, they're also regular people that like sit in their room and scroll through YouTube videos, lurk streams. It, it's a nice reminder that, yeah, we're just like people that like to play games and nerd out about like random stuff, you know? Absolutely.
the yeah. great unifier. Even the the game of chess itself watches some some Gen three or you game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that great? I mean, like, yeah, like, there's this one a viewer of mine. I don't know if you've ever seen Changer Danger. He does, like, a lot of, like, ocean cleanup or, like, scuba diving videos. I think like, I've really seen him in your chat and I checked the channel. I was like, whoa, what the heck? Yeah, he <laughs> consistently watches my stuff all the time. And it, that's just, he's just like, a, he's like a regular. And, but, like, and before I didn't even know who he was. But, yeah, he has, like, these, like, crazy YouTube shorts or just, like, these really surreal like underwater kind of ocean videos and then he goes home and he's just like watching this dude play pokemon emerald battle factory it's just so like <laughs> yeah i don't know for real. It's just cool you sometimes I, I can't help but think sometimes that some of my viewers because you get a notification in youtube studio when like a pretty big youtuber comments and sometimes yeah, i haven't yeah. heard of them but it's like some guy who's yeah. really good at piano he's like some orchestra composer or something and it's just funny to think that this guy's watching some pokemon videos in his downtime i know right? it's like some genius right? level guy it's like whoa yeah it's cool stuff and of course we have that privilege as people that have a little bit of a following i mean obviously stephen hawking or some genius level scientist He's going to come home and watch, I don't know, the Big Bang, th like some mundane thing. He's not, it's not like he's yeah, a genius yeah. every day of the week. It's just, he's going to come home and play some Pokemon. You don't, you don't always obviously, want to be. You don't think about that. You don't think of them that way, but obviously yeah. they're, they're just a bloke. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, what what's something that you do in your, in your downtime besides Pokemon? You got like, you're a movie fan or like anime or something? Um, yeah, you know what? I'm good. I mean, like. Pokemon is re I'm a very one track person like a lot of what I do in my free time really is like Pokemon stuff like whether I'm like nerding out about generation three draft league and like talking to people about ideas for their draft or prepping or like I'm like lurking twitch streams that are like you know doing I don't know like something Pokemon related but like something that I'm doing that I do in my free time outside of Pokemon. I mean, like, you know, hang out with people at college or like hang out with my girlfriend or like stuff like that. Let's see. I mean, like videos wise, I really like watching anything that's like um, I'm really I really like watching uh, speed run stuff on YouTube history of like insert speed run. There's this one YouTuber that a couple weeks ago really blew my mind. He's this guy named Os Osukuri and really small YouTuber. And what he does is he investigates obscure Nintendo 64 games. And he's usually one of like two or three people that have ever like speed ran like just an obscure and forgotten game. And he gives it this whole new kind of world of depth as he tries to like figure out like, how can we beat this as fast as possible? And like that kind of stuff, I just like eat eat up it just speed like, runs like really obscure up. games no one's played yeah or like even maybe like one or two people have played it but they like maybe uploaded a speed run like you know five years ago or something like that just like totally kind of like games that kind of like forgotten a bit right and like that stuff That's is very just cool. like it's just really interesting to me yeah but uh speed runners are some of the truest gamers out there i got a buddy who's like a final fantasy speed runner he's called sayo and it, it blows my mind i just tune into his stream he's like in hour seven of like a 20 hour yeah. speed run he just dedicates a day and you just got to know the mechanics in and out he speed runs other games too like monsters inc for the ps1 like what the hell is that <laughs> what yeah dude yeah like random like uh movie games right like there's like a really cool speed run for toy story on the nintendo 64 that was like yeah. one of this guy's videos and it was just like you know crazy like buzz Lightyear strats and i don't know it's just I like think that so was a pretty cool. good game do people like that game i think i remember playing that one it was a toy story 2 for yeah. the n64 you play as buzz Lightyear. yeah something like that yeah and like uh i don't know that stuff i uh really eat up but like outside of like video game stuff sometimes i'll get into like little random sports like i used to be a runner you know that's what lrxc that little runner xc xc was cross country i used to do a lot of that trying to get active this summer i might get into this sport called racquetball i don't know if you've ever heard of racquetball but i want to i want to try some racquetball um it's like tennis but like in like a giant box um i think i've just, heard that somewhere yeah like recently is yeah, that a recent invention or something oh it's it's definitely a lot like a north american thing like a one of our creations i guess <laughs> but, there's a uh, lot of those weird tennis offshoots like squash yep, it's like tennis ball. but 
you hit the wall. Yeah, that squash is like almost identical to racquetball. Um, ah. but yeah, I'm looking to try to get into stuff like that. But admittedly, yeah, a lot of my time is definitely uh, dedicated to Pokemon. But it's just because I love, I love Gen Three Pokemon. I bet just it's just a a huge part of my identity. So yeah, I spend a lot of time on it. Don't you get burnt out? I get a bit burnt out sometimes. I do always find myself coming back to it though. It's it's kind of funny, but. Don't you ever feel like you can't look at Pokemon right now? You got to do something else for a sec. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be real. That's not usually not. I don't like. I don't usually get like. I don't usually get like Pokemon burnt out. But like, you know, I can also stream for like absurd, you know, hours. So it's just kind of, it's just kind of like all encompassing for me. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't really get like. Maybe some point, you know, it's inevitable. Like, you know, I, I, am I going to like Generation Three of Pokemon when I'm 40 years old? I would wager not. But like, when that moment comes, it'll come. I'm just gonna enjoy my like, you know, my fascination with it right now. So. I think I'll probably still be a Gen Three head at at 50. <laughs> like, like, I think I'm just all in. <laughs> yeah. Like meta game developments. I wonder what the hell that metagame is going to look like. Are we going to... I know, right? Is it going to be Suicune number one? <laughs> it feels... I, I always feel like that's the ultimate endgame is just Suicune, Claydol, Skarm, Mirrors. But I, maybe not. Honestly, there's always ways to beat whatever's... Uh, I don't know. I've always felt like Jirachi will, like, have a point where, like, I could just... I don't know. I think the, the Serene Grace aspect of it... I feel like people are going to get really, like, psycho about, like, Ice Punch Freeze. I don't know. I feel like Jirachi is my yeah, random freeze take close, of, like... though, at least. Yeah, but I don't know. I hope it never gets stale, but, like, it could be inevitable. The few times I've played know. against ABR, he uses Wish uh, Defensive Rachi a lot, and the way he uses it, it feels, like, frustratingly optimal, where he's just taking every opportunity he can to fish for the burn, and it, it's kind of like it's just a matter of time before he lands the burn, and I'm just going to yep. slowly wither away. It's not like he's making some flashy predict or like getting me in this, which he can do when he needs to, but he's also just an expert planner where he just finds yeah. every opportunity to squeeze in that little chance of... Which is why ABR is lucky, in quotation marks. <laughs> nah, you make your own luck in Pokemon. It's an aspect people don't appreciate. Hard to identify when people are just squeezing in every little chance possible to get things to work in their favor. Yeah, it's a beautiful part of Battle Factory too, is like maximizing your chances of everything and like minimizing the chances that something catastrophic could happen. You have a lot more control of it in Factory. It's also at the same time, like the worst aspect of it because you just get froze sometimes. It is, lose. it is. But... I'm, I'm drawn, I don't know about you, I'm drawn to games with RNG elements like card games and deck builders and stuff like that. Yeah, because I'm, I'm a big, and I don't even know if this has to play in the, like with Pokemon, but like I love the concept of an underdog. That is something that I am very, very attached to. You know, there's the college basketball tournament, like March Madness in America. I am only I literally only watch the first week of games, but I watch the 16 seed, the 15 seed, and the 14 seed games because, like, if they do have some sort of monumental upset, I want to feel like I'm a part of that, like, story. Like, seeing these monumental upsets, like, live, that's something that, like, I really feed off of. I just think that's such a cool thing. And, like, in games, yeah, with RNG elements, I think sometimes the coolest things that happen sometimes aren't like when someone just dominates someone but when someone has been dealt a little bit worse of a hand than the other person yet triumphs like that's just such a it's just a, such a cool yeah thing. that's I awesome know. there's the recent SPL games with m dragon he just got so unlucky but he just he finds a way you can tell he's not even tilted by the way he's playing he just like stone cold uh focused and finds a way out that's like the best those yeah. are the most the hype games. It's like a sport, right? Like when you watch sports, like you want you the know, big comeback. Yeah. Want, yeah. You want the comeback. You want like the, the overcoming adversity. Like that's such a, it's a fundamentally compelling thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It really is. I don't know if you watch like, I used to be a big fan of melee smash bros melee. Oh yeah. They're some of the yeah. greatest sets I, ever is that someone's down to their last stock and they just make it happen. Yeah. I, I mean, I used to actually play melee like uh, four, three, four years ago, I got into melee quite a bit, like really into melee, like going into tournaments, like practicing. Me like, too. Yeah. Uh, 
all of that stuff. It's such a, an amazing game. Maybe the best competitive game I've ever experienced or like seen. Just the skill gap. I remember like walking into a Smash tournament, right? And I was going to play Ultimate. And I looked to my left and I see these people playing Melee. And like I knew about it kind of, but then once I really got into it, the main thing that I appreciated in a weird way is like when I was entering tournaments and getting annihilated by someone, it was like I got like, there were, I had a 0% chance to beat someone. And in a way, I like that because it showed like the skill gap, how good you can get in like working towards that. And I didn't feel it as much in like ultimate. It felt a lot more like formulaic, just not as not enough abilities to like express yourself. Right. But yeah, melee is awesome. I mean, like low tier mains, I was always really attracted to like I would always be everybody loves Dom so right? Yoshi. Yeah, but even even like the lower, lower ones. Right. Like I was I was watching a Twitch stream of this uh, Zelda main. Not chic, but Zelda main from Washington <laughs> with like three, four viewers. And I was just watching them lab out different texts and stuff like that. And like, I was like eating that up. Like, oh, like this Zelda is really cool. And they're dedicated to this low tier character. I mean, I literally, I, my first main was actually Game & Watch because I wanted to be that kind of low tier main hero. Like that's who I, that's who I wanted to be. It's pretty hard with those super low tiers in, uh, in Melee though. It is. I it think is. that like Donkey Kong is getting some recent respect, isn't he though? Isn't he like right? in the ranks that's pretty awesome oh super rising you gotta love yeah. donkey kong i always love donkey kong i love seeing donkey kong players like i there is this dk documentary i don't know if you saw it um the i'll have the, to check that out Renaissance. oh yeah by was tunes amazing video about the dk renaissance of like the like kind of like the history of competitive dk in melee and like this new renaissance that kind of started in like the COVID era of like dk getting like super developed and getting like results and stuff like that like that's so uh that's just like so sick the coolest tournament memory i have is i went to this australian major in like i think it was 2014 and the international players came and there was like a there was someone his name was mojo monkey up against chillin dude and he was playing jigglypuff and he was down two games and then in game three he just went dk and the entire crowd what it say they started sick of the dk yeah. rap in the crowd oh my gosh yeah he he lost but it was like actually really close and awesome yeah but it's like you it's like oh my god could you like reverse this dude with it's DK? just when someone it's suddenly like, goes dk it's like holy yeah <laughs> it's just awesome. yeah that's i was i didn't get to see this live but one of like the coolest thing that i felt like i experienced through like a youtube video there is this a Mewtwo main from Japan that came to an American tournament, like just out of nowhere. Like nobody knew about this dude that was like playing Mewtwo. And he beat this like top Marth player, right? I think, I think his name was, uh, I think it was like Cactuar or something like that. But this Mute, I don't know if he beat him or if it like came really close, but it was just kind of like out of nowhere, kind of like a mini Ampsa, right? Like kind of like, you know, someone that's out of the States coming in and like out of nowhere using an unexpected character. And just like the hype, something like that about to happen or potentially happen. I don't know. It's just such a, such a cool thing. Mewtwo is one of the coolest characters. I love the teleporting so cool. and stuff. And so sick. I think people reckon he's one of the characters that's like unexplored who couldn't randomly be good if you optimize yes. him. People I really think so too. Because you've got the I double really jump canceling so. tech and all this weird stuff. Because yeah. you can teleport to the platforms as well, and that's an amazing movement. Yeah, yeah, it just sucks that with his when he dash dances, his tail pops out. So like dash dancing is yeah, like Yeah, why'd they get a there's a lot of stuff in Melee that's kind of annoying. Like, Mr. Game & Watch randomly has no... Doesn't he have, like, no yeah. shield? Like, what, what? They just forgot to give him a shield. His full shield doesn't cover the tips of his hands and his, like, feet. So, like, what his do? defensive options are... And then also, like, uh, you can, like, L cancel aerials. But for some reason, there's a bug where Mr. Game & Watch cannot oh, cancel. Oh, yeah, he can't L cancel. That's effed up. On two of them, he can. His, uh, his uh, back air, thank God, can L cancel. And then I don't know which other one it was. It's like a nice one but it still is unfortunate that like yeah he has like weird ending lag but like and like if those things were fixed like he'd probably be a bit better i mean like his combo options are nuts like my he's favorite... decent he's got good normals and he's easy around yeah have you ever seen curb q e r b he's I like one of I remember my that. that just unlocked a memory i remember that guy yeah he's one of my favorite melee players of all time and he was like a the, probably the first OG like Game & Watch main. Like a couple of years ago, he almost cracked like top 100 with Game & Watch, released like these classic mid 2010s melee montages and it was curb stomped, but Q-E-R-B like 
Daft Punk in the background, like Microsoft presentation, like transitions, but like it was just so classic. cool. This dude that was just like cracked with Game and Watch. Melee's awesome. I kind of had to choose. I kind of had to choose between Melee and Pokemon like three summers ago because like I was going to these tournaments, but I also wanted to be doing Pokemon stuff, and like I just didn't have time for both, and I didn't want to be wishy washy in both of them. I wanted to like you know go deeper into one of them, and like I chose Pokemon. <laughs> I did the same thing. I chose Pokemon over Melee. I, I accepted that I was just average at melee. I probably would never be like an actual, not even power ranked in my region, let alone anywhere near a yeah. top level competitor. But in Pokemon, I thought I did have that potential to actually be all right in yeah. tournaments. Melee just takes too much time. You got to practice tech skill daily. Guys, yeah. And just be playing. You, you almost can't play anything else if you if you want to take it seriously. Yep. There's a lot of cool competitive games out there. What's a what's another one that like you've been interested in? A buddy of mine is a professional TF2 player. You know TF2. Oh, dude! TF2 I is the TF2 is so cool, man. Crazy, crazy meta. Like we're like a, you can't have like all scouts and stuff like that. Yeah, like, but you got. Uh, uh, is it one or two scouts per team? They got a, like a six v six format where there's like a certain amount of classes you can have. Yeah. One medic because medic's broken. But uh, yep, yeah. My buddy's a soldier player. It's the coolest class because you could do rocket jumping. He yeah. sends clips where he just like he sent me this clip where he just in like three seconds zoomed through the whole map and just sniped the enemy medic <laughs> out of so nowhere. Sick. And like the the rocket sends him into the air and then you hit him in mid air with the second rocket because they're on a trajectory that's like straight up so you can line it up. Yeah. It's so cool when yeah. someone makes a sick TF2 play. It is crazy. I like, I think it was like a month ago. I just like saw this Team Fortress 2 stream, right? And I was like, oh, I used to play that game. And it was like this really small stream about like this rookies cup and just the the pace of the game was so crazy and i was so interested in like what the meta is like and like because it's so it's so interesting because like it's the same characters yet a lot of people still like love playing the game it's kind of you know it's kind of like an older generation of pokemon or like melee where like when the cast is smaller the resources i guess are stagnant but it's because of that restrictions that then that creativity and like the depth kind of blossoms you know what i mean yeah absolutely like, the the classic yeah. competitive game type thing like street fighter third strike and those older games those things are so attractive to me like the ideas of that Ra random tangent that's related to this but i went to this like mega gigantic arcade a couple weeks ago right and all these arcade machines have like world records and even like in facility records and it kind of made me interested like there, there's like all of these arcade cabinets that probably have a really interesting history but because like it was so hard to like record yourself playing almost or like it's not like there's like arcade games online and stuff like that it's probably like really hard to document and like really hard to see the history but like i feel like that's such an untapped potential for like content and like videos and just like intrigue the world record history of like x random arcade game i think like stuff that they does exist wasn't there one about donkey kong king of yeah, kong yeah but every everything else like not not just the the big ones but like oh, the, the random crap yeah. yeah i mean like i went to an arcade and they had like over 900 arcade cabinets no joke 900 arcade cabinets Jeez, some that are like exclusively from japan and all this different stuff and like a lot of the world records were actually in this like arcade because it's like one of the biggest arcades in america and stuff like that but it was just kind of fascinating me like wow how were strategies developed like did people have online forums where they'd like share strategies because you know there wasn't like discord and like you know because some of these records are still records from like 1990s yeah it's just totally unexplored and why would anyone optimize this random game that could be really interesting to investigate that do like a little documentary about some I, obscure I thing so for too. sure because here's the thing like the only people that know a lot about those arcade games are 35 to 40 year olds that have kids and like you know what i mean like it's just kind of a it's like their past right and like they're not gonna go out and like make videos about arcade games that they grinded with their nerdy friends in like the mid 90s you know what i mean or like even like the early 2000s like you know Right, There's yeah. so much. The games that are on your computer and your consoles and your phones are just way more popular and, you know, accessible for people compared to like a an actual arcade cabinet in an arcade. I don't know. I was already looking into like some like different arcade games that just like, oh, there's like this one called like the Wiggler or the, not the, the Nibbler. And it's like this like snake that goes around and gets dots. And I was just like, whoa, what's like 
what's like the strat on this? What's, like, what's the, the meta for the nibble? I don't know. It's kind of like, it's kind of crazy. Like, I feel like people would eat it up just like people love, you know, old Nintendo 64 yeah, the history games. of Monsters, Inc. for the PS1. Is, it's the same yeah, thing. Yeah, like, people love that. Again, it's definitely because of, like, information accessibility. But, like, yeah, that, I feel like that is such an untapped thing. Like, I feel like people would watch like history of this arcade machines world record. And, You're on like, something. That... It would take some some investigative work though. That'd be like a months to years long project of navigate figuring out who the you hell played this game. You can't just go to a Discord. You can't just find a Discord and then tag like the main person and be like, "Hey, want to talk?" <laughs> like these are people that are probably scattered across the world in their 30s, 40s, and 50s and haven't thought about the game in a long time because they had to move on to real life there was no there was no career path to be like an arcade youtuber <laughs> you know what i mean I don't that know. reminds me of have you did you ever watch that game about this mcdonald sorry this video about a mcdonald's ds game that was like lost yes! for years yes that's one uh, of the best videos on youtube dude and there was this whole no, like I'm with you. worldwide manhunt for this there was this other guy competing with the guy to, to discover the game with yes! this race yes there was like... oh my god i can't believe you watched that video is by a, a nate robinson nate robinson i believe is his or is it nick robinson let me I see. think it's nate nick robinson. robinson yeah no nate robinson's a basketball player i always get this mixed up it's nick robinson yes dude oh my gosh that video was unreal i love that video i'm so i'm so with you did you see his uh did you ever see his uh recovering the the blastoise one I've, I've seen the the thumbnail i haven't watched that one. Oh, that one is also like a next level like <laughs> nick robinson video like it has that i don't know how he does it so well but he makes things that are seemingly mundane into these full-fledged like documentaries right like he does it so well it's so cool and he did it perfectly in that mcdonald's ds game video that was so sick that's what i like about youtube is there would be no official studio sanctioned documentary about such a topic ever but some guy who's yeah. just obsessed with this specific thing can make a this deep dive video on it and it's just this fascinating topic you've never heard of before. I think that's where YouTube really shines as a platform. It does. You're so you're so right about that. I never even thought about that because like, it, in, if I like if video if making videos didn't stress me out as much as they do sometimes, I would love to do. I would love to investigate like you know world record history of Emerald's Battle Tower, like the history of like the strategies and stuff like that is so. That would stretch back to like, like before forums and stuff existed too back in the damn yeah like the dog the, days the, the histories of that is like so it, it's really interesting and it's like totally untapped like you know just because you know people are like playing on their game boy and yeah they might you know talk on like a smoke on forum or just like a forum before but like yeah it's, that's like interesting stuff even like i want to do one like the battle palace like that one's crazy like i think i kind of tapped into that with this battle factory thing right it kind of mixed like a new pokemon challenge with this element of like nostalgia that like people could also kind of like connect to like oh yeah i did the battle frontier and stuff like that's that. that's what's cool but, about uh, it is just literally the default game but you could push it this far you know that's what's cool <laughs> that's about the it. coolest part that was the the biggest thing for me in it was like august when i was like just getting into it and it was just this really i've just never felt a feeling like i did when i was like just playing battle factory and getting some like okay streaks but also this insane depth of a challenge yet it wasn't something like a literally made up meta game like AEVOU or like a hardcore nuzlocke like i was just like oh my god like this is this is in the game like this is in the game and that's so cool that it's been here since the early 2000s and it's just there it kind of added this element of sacredness to it or like maybe more like purity yeah I something you. just so awesome yeah i do think like as i've gotten older uh, the the single player pokemon games aren't my favorite of all time usually but i do have some respect for pokemon emerald in particular i feel like uh they they just hit a lot of creative boxes yeah the end game stuff is probably the coolest in the whole franchise and just the pokemon designs are like they feel inspired and they've got a lot of hearts they like do. some random oh, crap so like you. you think of random mons in gen 3 like kecleon it's not like a top tier mon but it has some flavor it's, it's got like the color change cool. concept and the and you find it on the road i feel like something they've lost that element of uh i'm I don't so know. i'm so with you i'm glad i'm glad we can both of us gen three heads can like talk <laughs> about this because i'm i'm so it sounds like a boomer take but i am so 
And it might also be because we're just more inherently connected to Gen 3 because that's like our main interest. But I'm so with you when I see Pokemon like Sarah Ledge and Armor Rouge. I'm like, oh, it's I a bit over design. It's like a human. I didn't want Mega Man villains in my game. Like it, it's just <laughs> it just feels like and I don't know. Again, it might just be the the nostalgia goggles. But like and because we're more. I feel a lot more connected to like Gen 3 Pokemon, but yeah, I feel like every design just feels like a Pokemon and even the bad, uh, in quotation marks, you know, forgettable Pokemon still have like something, yeah, something like inspired with it instead of just like, oh my gosh, those stupid future forms of Pokemon. I oh, don't, oh, don't even get me started. Like I, I, I got a lot of requests back in the day to uh, make a video about Iron Jugulus, and I was like, fine, I'll do a video about Iron Jugulus. It's just me absolutely shitting on Iron Jugulus the whole time. Oh. It, it's the stupidest Pokemon ever done. It's it's Hydreigon, but he's a robot, and he's called Iron Jugulus. Who the hell named that? And he's, <laughs> he's, he's so boring. He's dark flying. It's so much less cool than Dark Dragon. He has like no moves. He's got Hurricane, like, who cares? <laughs> the worst Pokemon ever. I'm so by with far. you. Like, I, I remember, like, two years ago, right? And I was, like, I was, like, actually kind of excited about um, Gen 9. Because when Gen 8 came out, I was kind of taking a little break from Pokemon. But with Gen 9, I was getting back into, like, Pokemon stuff. And I was, like, oh, I was kind of, like, excited about a new game, right? And I didn't, I was, you know, I got the game, I played through into like the first gym and I was like, oh, you know what? I kind of want to just spoil myself on everything. I don't want to miss like the in inception of like competitive gen nine on showdown. I remember like opening up the team builder, right? Looking at the Pokemon and I was genuinely sad. Like I was genuinely sapped of energy. I was just like, I really dislike these Pokemon, they just, I don't know. They just didn't feel like, I, I don't really know. I don't really know if I can put my, my, my finger on it. To their credit, some of the lower tier Pokemon, like the crappy Pokemon are actually quite, uh, creative. I like Tinkaton. I like Belly Bolt is a cool yeah. one. I like these random yeah, little ones. I like those two. I like those two. Yeah, a lot of the top tier guys are just very min-maxed, overtuned. Usually they don't have a very interesting ability or it's just like, what if I did more damage? That's their ability, you know? Yeah, I'm so I'm so with you. I mean, like the Iron Mons, I mean, like some of like the past things are kind of cool. Just like the different Iron Mons or just like Serilege and Armor Rouge. Jesus Entei Christ, with a big I hat and it's called Gouging Fire. <laughs> I, I kind of like it's... Uh, Designed in, in game, but like flavor wise, they really took two seconds with that one. It doesn't even look that different, Ente. <laughs> I don't know. And like, again, you know, then again, it is, I, it's kind of hard to come up with different ideas once there's like so many Pokemon and we'll always be comparing it nah, man. to what there's, they did. Look earlier. at all these, uh, like fan games that have really cool designs. No, it's, that too, though. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's literally like, the perfect idea. It's just fantastical creatures and you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, you can go yeah. in any direction in the, on Earth. I, I really gave them a, what do you call that? I really gave them an olive branch with that one. <laughs> they have been in the game but, longer yeah. than anyone, but I mean, it's the perfect uh, base, fundamental base to just make creative stuff. I think that yeah. to, there's also an extent of like Pokemon is this media mogul and they're kind of rushed way more than other Nintendo games. I think other Nintendo games have more time to breathe because they don't have this Pokemon company looming over them. I was looking at this thing where it showed the revenue split of the whole Pokemon franchise. The games were like a tiny little slip and the biggest one was merchandise and it was like half of the thing, more than half of the revenue comes from merchandise. So I think their business uh -huh. model is that the quality of the games don't matter that much. It's just getting new Pokemon out there to make merchandise of. It probably drives Makes the whole sense. thing. And if you get like a couple of hits, like, you know, oh, Tinkaton or whatever, like that's all that. I yeah, mean, literally you get like, like two or three. Starters are cute, OMG. I mean, okay, I do really like Fue Coco, I will admit. I really, I really like Yeah, Fue I Coco, think that's but... probably where they put the most effort in, is the little cute guys that they can sell toys yeah, of. Yeah, the little, he made me excited for poke, like the game. I was like, oh, it's a little like fire crocodile. I'll say Skeledurge like... is one of the better ones of new Pokemon. I like Skeledurge. Yeah. Yeah, Meow Scarada, oh my god, like whatever, like kind of interesting, but also like, and I know this is like such a a, a hackneyed take, but like, you know, yeah, like, can we get the four legs again? I don't, like some Pokemon, like, I'm with too you. many, I'm with you on that. Too many <laughs> bipedal, too many bipedal Pokemon. Like Delphox, like, just like what Delphox too, looks yeah, a little oh, weird. Like, yeah, like, I don't know. It's just yeah. Pokemon Boomer Hour on the, on the fridge. Let's go back to Gen 1. Remember, remember Dodrio? <laughs> 
<laughs> that was a Pokemon. <laughs> now that was yeah. inspired. That was a work of art. Now we're out here with Iron Jugulus. <laughs> It is true. It is true. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I kind of like the palafin, palafin hero thing. I guess that's like that's cute. I guess it's a bit. It's a bit overtuned though. I guess they don't. They're not balancing around singles, so they don't care. But in doubles, it was no, kind of interesting. No, I know. I mean, like Fluttermane, the most min max thing like ever. Like come. Yeah. Come, come on, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like when things get so supercharged, I just feel like it just loses its luster. That's that's a whole other tangent. But like, yeah, I don't know. I what do you what did you think of what do you think of Terra? like in general as a concept i think i like it more than z moves okay i don't know if i loved z moves at the time i didn't hate them i kind of got used to them but in retrospect it's a pretty lame mechanic it's <laughs> what if it moved dealt, dealt one million damage the cool part of z moves yeah. is like the utility ones like uh, z hypnosis or something that gives you speed boost yeah. or uh, z heal bell was a cool one it heals your team of status and fully heals you I use that in Gen 7 Ubers a bit. I think it, I think, and this would have been, you know, a little bit audacious, but I think it would have been cooler if, like, there was more of the, like, unique Z moves. And they all didn't have to be super overpowered, but, like, giving, like, like, way, 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 way more Pokemon a unique Z move. That, they don't even have to be super good. Yeah. But just that and even of, the unique, unique ones are usually just a big nuke. They're not anything that special. You might have like some yeah. exclusive, like Necrosium Z. It's just, what if I dealt 300 base power? <laughs> That's the idea. And it's also like in Ubers, you know, like not everybody's like doing Ubers stuff. And like even like in VGC, like those mods don't come out in like the meta until like, you know, like way later I think or in, something um, like that. In VGC, Terra is actually pretty cool because you got like Terra Grass. I'm with you. Or, uh, in, in VGC, it's actually quite cool, especially compared to DMAX and uh, Z moves, which were not so that cool in, in uh, VGC. So with you. Because there is actually a lot of depth to how Terra shapes things, because there's plays where like a Fluttermane has to Terra Fairy, but then loses Ghost, so you can fake it out if you predict it. Or like Terra Grass dodges Powder, so you can get past Rage Powder. Or Terra Dark to dodge uh, Prankster. And those are yeah. very common things that come up. So. There's a lot of ways to play with the mechanic. I watch I watch Gen 9 VGC stuff a lot, actually. I didn't watch a lot of Gen 8. I didn't watch a lot of Gen 7. But I really liked watching Gen 9 VGC stuff. Like, it was kind of, like, cool. It felt a little bit more understandable and a lot less, like, you know, super heavy on, like, oh, the Gigantamax. So, like, that just felt, like, so different but the terra yeah like there is a it's almost like wow it's cool that there is a mechanic that has an upside and a downside that's that's an idea like <laughs> like i like that that was that was nice to see and uh you know options for creativity and stuff like that i don't really know how i feel about terra and gen 9 ou because like i don't i don't play gen 9 ou and i haven't really like I think it's overall it bad, all. but it's. A, I think it's more interesting than Z-Boost, though, because it, it at least yeah. enables uh, cool team building where you can have some random Terra type on. Like, you can be a bit creative with it. There's also dynamic ways to use it. It's like a decision that's dynamic, because every Pokemon on your team can Terra, and every game you're going to Terra somewhere different. But also, like, it also just skews towards using it to get more stab or using it to get a turn to yep. Dragon Dance once and win, which is a bit lame. But it I is. mean, I guess they just have no regard for singles balance lately. And to their credit, is it is really interesting in VGC. But at the same time in VGC, I don't love the selection of Pokemon as like Fluttermane yeah. dominates a lot. I do like, I get interested in watching VGC when it's like a new regulation for like a week or so. And then it's kind of like, oh, uh, okay. It is, there is cool aspects to VGC. But I gotta say, I feel like something like Gen 3 or U is more compelling. It's got more flavor and like mystique yeah yeah definitely and it's like that kind of you know i also think it's cool that like when i think some people when they think of gen 3 ou there's kind of these mysterious titans of like gen 3 ou that are out there all the time because it's it's not the current generation it's not like the most you know popular thing like in vgc you have people that like you know because like they make big youtube videos or like they're streaming or they're like you know just kind of like in the circle but with gen 3 it's like kind of like oh it's like you know it's like a hidden boss if you go to like a melee local or something like that. I don't know. Can There's I like say something like a... that's a little lame about VGC? Yeah. Do I don't it. like that you have to register under your full legal name. Instead of a gamer tag. I feel like when there's a gamer tag, it's like you can create this little identity. Like in Smash, yeah. you know, you got Mango and Hungry Bot. Like, it's important that they have the tag. If it was just like Joseph Smith or whatever, <laughs> it'd be much like... I think to, something else, Wolf Glick, I love him. I think half the reason that he's popular is because his name is awesome. He sounds like a gamer tag. Wolf Glick. <laughs> That's yeah, a big advantage like in VGC because no one... You can't... If your name's John Smith, sorry... You're not getting like a. Who's that? Who's that really good? A uh, fighting game player? Like what? Like he has like a. Is it no, Daigo? Right by VGC. 
Oh, Justin Wong? Wong? Justin Wong. Yeah, something, it's not like, oh, like, that's like a, I don't know, I'm with you there. Wolf Glick sounds a little bit more, you know. That's an epic gamer name. Taggy. Yeah, but it's just kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of with you. It is interesting though, right? Because I, I'm with you. I think I like gamer tags in more modern games, but in a past thing, such as like the arcade stuff, I think it's really cool to see like, oh, first name, last name has this world record. I don't know if it's because it paints them as like a more like an older person that like, you know how like in a- um, I think it makes sense know, for like back in, in the day, right? The game of tag, it was a more modern invention. Yeah, and it's kind of cool. Like if you see like, you know, Mario Kart, history stuff and like some of the best players are like you know first name last name or like first name la like if you've seen a summoning salt video like first name last name had this you know yeah record i think back. that's justin wong is kind of cool because in a world where everyone else has a gamer tag he's just justin wong i think if you yeah. make a conscious choice to name yourself that i think what's lame in vgc is you have no choice you just have to do yeah, that you're right but if, if it's like, I'm just going to call myself my name, I'm just me. And it's it's a yeah. fairly basic sounding name like Justin Wong, but he's like one of the best players of all time. That's pretty cool. There's a storyline. It's like a decision being made there. I'm with you. Yeah, they should. Like the gamer. I mean, I don't really. I wonder where that tradition comes from with Pokemon. I mean, is it just because like legal reasons? Or I mean, I don't know. That can't be it. There's other reasons. But like League of Legends is huge. They got gamer tags. Yeah. Imagine if Faker was just like Justin Wong. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's Faker sounds awesome. Yeah. Everyone knows Faker. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. Yeah, Ninja and Fortnite was like first name last name. Yeah, Ninja. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that is that's interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the VGC gamers have they've got uh, YouTube channels where they do have a game attack. But yeah, I guess it's it's a bit harder to be known as a game attack when. In the tournaments themselves, they don't have that. Yeah, and they're like staying at hotels and like, you know, they're meeting each other in person. Like, have you ever tried VGC? You ever been to a tournament? I had a little brief VGC phase back in Gen I've never 7. I've tried it. I've never, well, okay, I have tried it like on Showdown a bit. And I, I did do a lot of, I did a good amount of Gen 3 VGC, like Ori Coliseum and stuff oh, like that. Yeah, I got into that fun. for a bit. But an in person tournament, no. But I would at some point like to go to an in person tournament. I just think that would be a, I've, I've heard good things about them. I've heard good things about Everyone them. Everyone was very nice. It was yeah. a cool cool vibe there. Yeah, and I think that would be... It is, it's It's a bit weird when you get hacked and it's in real life and you're looking the guy in the eye. It's a very different <laughs> feeling. I, yeah. I remember um, there was a situation where I crit this guy's Kyoga and I was just like, sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny, like before, like you're behind your screen and you're like, you know. But I don't know what uh, the etiquette is. Are you supposed to say bad. like, sorry, man, or are you just, is it like in Melee when you're SD, you don't say anything? <laughs> yeah, because you're like, or like even like on Showdown, you're just like, you know, my B, but then you can just like keep focusing on the game. But now you have to deal with this person, like making eye and contact. Sometimes they're like, ah, they like have body language, it's like annoyed. <laughs> I played against this guy who was using like his in-game team. He had no restricted. It was just like yeah. one Trevenant and like Bruxish. I just one hit them all with a Veltal. I, I, I just knocked off his whole team. And he was like, he looked so sad. And I was like, I felt oh bad, but what are you going to do, man? I, you just so, should have came I mean, prepared. Like, that's so funny. That's the funniest thing. Like, yeah, like, you know, like Bruxish fan 67 decides to go to his local tournament. <laughs> like, that is it's so, funny that it was bruxish of all things. A pretty late, it's like an ugly looking <laughs> fish. It's like, I'm just a bruxish head. I'm freaking a, me and my bruxish are gonna win the championship. Yeah. <laughs> He goes in, he has like his like Bruxist plush with him. He's like super excited. He's like in real life, he's like, you know, he's like, go Bruxish. And then like you just like, you know, moon geist beam him with Lunala. Or, I don't like, know what he was something. thinking of Velta was on like every other team. That's <laughs> the funniest thing ever. Just like his hopes, like just, he has like, he has no idea like something like Discord exists. Like he's like, just like in his own little like world. Those are the guys in our like, YouTube Oak comments Garden. like, Smoke on bans everything. I use Bruxish. <laughs> 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 yeah, he just goes and he just just gets a knot. That's the funny. That's the funniest thing ever. And that's so. It's kind of like how like you know if you've watched like the Smash documentary, what early melee was like. Where like there wasn't these giant, you know these huge like boards of communication or like even just like your own little like like a neighborhood community and like you think you're really good with this one thing or you think it's the meta and you go to like something bigger and you just like you just realize the gravity yeah that's so funny 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, what did you, what do you even say to like Bruxish, you know, Trevin? You're like, hey, cool it was a bit Pokemon. of an awkward interaction. I was like, sorry, <laughs> man, rough, rough matchup, <laughs> <laughs> bad matchup. <laughs> Wait, do you even remember what they said? <laughs> he was like, he was kind of like nodding his head, like, yep. Like, it's like, like he's typical. Like, he's like mad. He's like, he's like, he's oh, like this guy's in cheating. his head. He's like legendary spam is man. <laughs> He it's was definitely like, in his like head that. furious, but he was. Oh, I don't. Man. I felt a l That's... pretty bad. But what are you, you gonna do? You have to because you. It's like <laughs> what are you gonna do? Pure... What am I supposed to do? <laughs> I can't let you win. Like I sometimes I wish, sometimes I wish I could like forget a ton of things about Pokemon and have like a p very pure rose tinted glasses view of like Pokemon and like yeah. competing. Like you know when I like beat you know the champion in Gen 3 with my Master Ball Relicant then I'm like Relicant this is so good. This is so awesome. Like Relicant is such a cool Pokemon and then you know you get into competitive Gen 3 and you're like oh wow this guy is like really bad. This thing is just not good. I don't know that but it must be a nice thing to kind of live in that pure world because like even if you try to play a new Pokemon game right like it's hard to not think about like, oh, is this one good? Like type diversity and like, you know, am I gonna get a good move? And, like you already like think about that stuff. I sometimes wish I could just like wipe that from my brain for a little bit and like hop on the Gen 3 ladder like EV zero. <laughs> yeah, there are some some people out there still like that and they comment oh, like, is there any niche for Crobat? I'm like, how do we tell them folks there isn't? <laughs> I'm sorry to say, <laughs> but this oh is Jimothy. I'm wondering if there's any niche for Meganium. They like type a whole like, you know, I had this experience with like Gen 3 1v1 Gen 3 1 v1 where like this dude wrote this a literal essay on like niche potential niches for like Stantler and Raichu. And it's almost just like it's so pure in a good way. Like he's like, yeah, what if I did Calm Mind, Skill Swap, Solar Beam, Stantler? And like, I'm just like, I love that. Right. Sometimes those people become god gamers though. There was this one guy, yeah. I don't know if he's still around on the Smogon farm, it was called like Camerupt fan 123. Yes, and he just guy, insisted yes. for years that Camerupt is good. <laughs> he was he was right. Camerupt isn't is actually all right. It is like it's not, you know, world shattering, but you can yeah, make something like, happen with Camerupt. You can. Yeah, th that is so great. Yeah, like just someone who's just very like I, there's something really pure about it, right? Like and we I I had that phase, you know, like when I got into competitive Pokemon, like I played Pokemon as a kid, but I was doing like, you know, Gen, like Oras UU. And I was like, you know, oh, I think a Selgore has this really, and I wrote like a, I spent a whole, like a couple hours writing this giant post on why I think a Selgore should be ranked. Like I wrote, I literally basically wrote an analysis of like, oh, it's like a cool rain lead with like this and that. And like, you, it's like so nice to have a very just a wide view of like a metagame instead of like going into a metagame and it's like oh yeah this is basically solve this this and this you know you get the tryhards that like optimize and like that's fine right but in a way yeah i kind of relate to like the dude in jim cool's comments i think crowback could be cool for like this this and this like it's just it's pure well that's how you find yeah. niches is exploring some random crap like super epic for us that's their whole thing just yeah the electrode the electrode that was so yeah, sick the electrode and the the lantern there was a lantern error that was short-lived to yep. be honest but it was something it was. <laughs> I, I I really thought that Lantern would have seen, like, I mean, it hasn't seen a single SPL appearance, I'm pretty sure. Like, I don't think it's good. I, really... I think it was a phase, and we've, we've passed it. Sometimes those amount to real things, like the camera up, you do see the occasional camera up. Camera yeah, up is a respectable like, yeah. Pokemon. I don't know if that's true of Lantern, though, unfortunately. I don't think so either. Or, like, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the mischievous, or like... My favorite one is Bennett. I'm a Bennett head. Yeah. Bennett is the coolest guy of all time. Watching your video on that. I remember specifically watching it in my car. It just, you were just kind of like, was like, it was like your Bennett live. And I was like, wait, that is kind of cool. That like, it totally shits on Brave. But on top of that, it's like, oh, you can like knock off and the shadow, like, I don't know. Like it was just kind of like- And I inspired me. like a little bit of a few people to optimize Bennett. And there's a really good team by Colin. Actually, one of my favorite mm -hmm. teams is like a Jolt Bennett, because Jolt sucks versus Claydol a little bit, but then Bennett fixes that, and it threatens Pursuit Tower at the same time. It's a lot in one. Good for like an yeah. aggro spikes. It's awesome. That's a Pokemon. Sometimes in Gen 3, I gain respect for a Pokemon I never thought twice about. Like Bennett, I never really looked at before. But now it's one of my favorite yeah. Pokemon. It's a little puppet guy. It's kind of cool. It's just a little dude. I like how small it is and how it could just one hit Tar. 
It's just a little puppet, but it has like 120, what was it, 110 attack? I think it's like 115. It is yeah. 115, yeah. That's a, that's a surprising attack stat. Yeah, I'm with you. You, It's cool how you build connections with, with Pokemon in like different ways, like absolutely and like through through like competitive meta games or like you know for me like even something like you know through battle factory like zatu is something i gave like i just did not care about at all like i i didn't care about zatu i love zatu it actually just... it's got a it's got a scowl it's got like a look that he's looking down on you yeah and then it became like this meme where like you know zatu is so bad in battle factory that it, it would like give me a free win every time i saw it and then i had to like use it once in like this streak and it was just kind of like cool because like clutched like a specific thing or like <laughs> so and you just kind of like build these connections with uh different pokemon yeah i don't know i've yeah, had that with, with macago a pokemon i never thought twice about <laughs> but people keep requesting i use it on my streams and i've i literally have a 100 percent win rate with macago and I don't know why, really? because it's like a piece of crap. It's literally like the worst Pokemon ever. It's fire rock. It's so slow, but I lit I just even get recovered. No, it's at least sand immune and it's flame body. Yeah. That's like the only things, but and like it, it kind of swaps into Gengar. If you like kind of, well, if they like... ice punch or will-o-wisp, you're good. And then you can shoot off yeah. an overheat. But yeah. every time I use it, I just miraculously, I played against a, some cursed three attack Snorlax with no earthquake and it just hard walled and flame bodied it. I was like, Makago, <laughs> let's go. And then yeah. another time it snapped us incoming swamp. It, it just blew up on a blissey. Yeah. I think it's so bad that people don't expect you to do anything and then it just hits you with an overheat. It's like, oh, actually, that's a move. <laughs> I don't know if it has an actual niche. It definitely doesn't, right? I mean, there's it does, just, there's zero percent, there's zero percent chance. Like, if you're trying to be like that weird like spit up fire type like you got rupt and then you got flareon as like the ultra niche stuff right like i'd rather use torkoal before mad cargo if anything i think actually makago is better than torkoal and OU just because of sand immune uh, yeah, that's the I only guess, reason yeah. I, I feel like torkoal in, in anu torkoal is good but in in OU, i think makago is a bit better uh, yeah i guess that's fair because like they both they both have well i mean torkoal's boom hits harder but like yeah but it's i it's think that cargo doesn't even get explosion it gets self-destruct which is funny yeah Mad Cargo is like 10 base points higher. Flame Body, let's go. That's kind of fun. The results don't lie, folks. 100% win rate. Yeah. But that's a Pokemon. You know what, like, I, something cool with Torkoal. This is random. But in uh, um the the Battle Pyramid speedrun, like the, the Battle Pyramid speedrun, which a couple people have done, the strategy, you actually use Torkoal. And the reason you use Torkoal is because it's a uh, it has its ability, White Smoke, halves like the encounter rate of every single Pokemon. So you will literally always face half of the Pokemon that like you normally would have. And white smoke is the only ability that does that like no matter the levels. So like intimidate does it, but it's only if it's like within five levels of your range, but white smoke does it like totally. So the speed run is you lead with Torkoal on the first moment you can, you click explosion. And then because you still have a dead Torkoal in your lead slot, white smoke is still in effect. And then you can actually have like a, a choice band slaking lead that just like annihilates everything but that's just such a cool little thing about torkoal where like torkoal is literally optimal that's when that's it comes awesome. to the speed that's cool as sometimes a pokemon has a niche in this very very specific thing wasn't like whiskash broken in battle factory that it's like trash everywhere else? it's not it's not broken but it's definitely like way better than like you would think it is just because yeah like compared to swampert right the only things that whiskash has over swampert that are like super threatening is fissure and also its ability oblivious where it can't get attracted but mainly fissure like that's the main thing where yeah whiskash is scarier because it has a uh, fissure but also like in factories so like there's swampert has like counter and mirror coat on a lot of its sets and the ai is weird where like sometimes they just like to use those moves even when they're not gonna like do much to you and you can play around that easily, but like Whiskash, there's no counter, there's no mirror coat. Yeah, it's Two just of getting, its yeah. sets have fissure. And like, yeah, like it can just like and you yeah, even attract comes into play sometimes where like it's like anti-hacks, where like just yeah, with the element of attract and like yeah, I don't know. But yeah, it's just like a cute little thing about you know, Whiskash. I remember your Whiskash video where, uh, what was it? I think Evito or someone like that used it in Gen 5. Oh, in Gen 5, it's or real. You... I saw it in the latest SPL again. It came back. Yeah.
it's so funny. Everybody is always asks like, you know, oh, does Whiskash have Dragon Dance in Gen Three? And like, no, unfortunately, that would make it interesting. I think that Torkoal thing. That's a video in the making. You should do make a video on that. How Torkoal yeah, like the solves this yeah. speed running problem, something like that. Yeah, it, it's cool, right? It's like a little uh, like of all things, it, it's it's also just hilariously important that Torkoal is able to boom as well. Like that's like such a because like you want Torkoal dead the entire most of the run, which I <laughs> which I think is just. <laughs> Like, there's like, some, imagine, some like comedy you're, to that. you're yeah. running around, you're running around with Torkoal's carcass. <laughs> like, That's useful like to you. That... Is any of the end game stuff in other Pokemon games cool? Or I feel like. Yeah, it's it, cool. Like in Gen 4, it's pretty cool. But the main problem, and I've said this a lot, and I might make a video on it, is that specifically if we're comparing the Gen 3 factory to the Gen 4 factory, the main problem is that one, what physical special split does is um, like in Gen 3, a lot of water types are going to do generally the same thing. They're going to be a water type. They're probably going to have a move like Surf, which will never be physical. And they kind of like fit into the same sort of roles with little niches. But then in Gen 4, when you add the physical special split, a lot of the times every Pokemon can kind of act like two Pokemon when you don't know what set they are, like a full special attack Garchomp and a full physical attack Garchomp. And they supercharged a lot of the, the sets more in that battle frontier where a lot of them have like max speed, max attack or special attack, you know, three to four big coverage moves. And it really did just kind of make it a lot more lame where it, instead of these really interesting scenarios with like deemed bad moves and like not optimal sets, it kind of turns into this, like, who has the faster Pokemon with the super effective move? Like, it's really unfortunate, yeah, but that's uh, why. Right, but in, in Gen opinion, 3, you got Gen different branching ways to win, like you can double team spam or, I don't know, yeah, PP stall or like weird little lines. Those lines are crafted, not even just through like, oh, like, haha, double team, but just even like things like, you know, a Vileplume that has Sludge Bomb and Petal Dance as its only moves and like, oh, I'm back against the wall against like that was like a big thing where it's like I had to stall out these pedal dance things and like oh it's not using PP while it's dancing which is actually terrible for me because I don't have a lot of moves left or like something like this and that that situation would have never happened if Vileplume was just like you know sunny days solar beam hidden power fire like I don't know just like something like right, that like right pedal it's dance has like a, a mechanic you can punish because of the it's locked in and stuff I think the best example is that in Gen 3 the Toro sets you have this Tauros where it's like, you know, it's a facade, thrash, earthquake, and swagger. Like, thrash has an interesting upside, downside thing where it's like, okay, consistent, accurate, normal move, but confuses yourself, and, like, you're kind of locked into it. The other three Tauroses don't have max speed. One is, like, max HP, max attack, and the other two are max attack, max special attack, because they gave the Tauroses moves like Surf and Thunderbolt and Flamethrower and Ice Beam, and it just makes Tauros so much less like broken and like it has downsides but then in gen 4 the toro sets are like there's a choice band toros with max speed mass max attack that's so dumb or a life orb toros with just four big moves like you know return earthquake and it's just kind of like yeah those are good sets but the creative interactions and dynamics and abilities that outplay like really really lessen in those scenarios yeah it's unfortunate but uh Thankfully, Gen 3 Factory exists, and it's one of the greatest things, so, uh, yeah. Kind of similar to Gen 3 OU and Gen 4 OU in their identities, but Gen 4 has more min-maxed threats and explosive offense. Yeah, I wouldn't say that I have the same gripe about Gen 4 OU, though. I think that's a very cool thing, and, like, it yeah. actually, like, ends up being something that's cool. It's definitely very different than Gen 4 Frontier, but, yeah, no, and I know you had that nice little physical special split. Well, it's interesting video. how the, the fundamental mechanics ripple throughout every part of the game in that way. Yeah. But fact, Battle Factory also has a bit of like, you can feel the power creep. Yeah, like Gen 3 had has this like perfect mid middle zone of predictability in terms of all of the sets that this Pokemon can have can do maybe generally the same thing or like defined roles. It's not like, damn, Ed, do I have to switch into a Draco Meteor or an Outrage, which do two totally different things because they're hitting on totally different sides of the spectrum. Yeah, and even just like things like Focus Sash, just dumb in the frontier in Gen 4 and like resist berries 
that's like the most fundamentally like annoying thing ever. Oh, in the Battle you know, Factory, they resist berries. That's a, in Gen yeah. in Gen Four, yeah, like you know, a Nine Tails with like a like Pasho berry. It's just it makes things more inconsistent and less in your control and like too chaotic. Gen Three has this perfect balance of you have to maximize your odds. You are in control and things are predictable, but in a way where you have to like figure it out. And yeah, it's just it's definitely it's definitely very different in a very good way. Gen Three factory and that stuff is but and i wish they did i feel like people want more post-game facility stuff in like later generations i mean i'd be afraid that they'd just kind of ruin it and make them kind of like lame more than just like a battle tower gen 3 had so much character in some of the facilities like just i don't know it's just really cool. I didn't even know about the Battle Pyramid until I watched your video. That's that's an interesting one. The Battle Pyramid. Very cool. Yeah. I feel like in my videos about physical special split and even my dedicated one about Gen 3, I didn't quite touch on all of my thoughts on like game design and, and why I appreciate Gen 3. Because it's a bit, uh, yeah. I find it a bit hard to articulate sometimes. I think sometimes people have this narrow view of what makes a game balanced, where it's just, if there's as many things that are viable as possible, that's a balanced game. But I think you have to take a look at like, what the what the competitive game centers around and whether there's like a healthy circle of counterplay to everything. That's like what's most important yeah. to me. Not, I don't know, can Crawdon to use Crab Hammer with physical stab. People fixate on that. So but much. I don't think that oh that's that God. important. You know, I think that there's things that are more I'm important. So and sometimes, not everything is perfectly symmetrical either where you know people are very up in arms about oh there's intimidate and burn but there's no equivalence for special attacks like in, if you just look at it on the surface level that you could look at that as imbalanced because you punish physical attackers and special attackers don't get punished but when you play the meta game it, it works itself out it's okay you know it's not like physical attackers yeah, are nowhere it, to be seen it, it, it works itself out it, i'm with you you know sometimes on like if i ever like talk about this topic people would be like personally i like it when my sneasel has like good moves and i'm like okay dude like sure but like i get it, i get that I perspective in the single player rpg but i think in competitive doesn't matter at all if there's like like oh my immersion is broken because shadow ball is a physical move i can't I I can't make sense of this universe anymore. Shadow Ball is physical. It's interesting, like people always just want more options, more options, more options. But like, sometimes it's nice to actually not have as, and it, it, this sounds like such a boomer take. Sometimes it's nice to not have technology and just appreciate nature, like something like that. But it, in a way, it's kind of like a, when you have less, well, less is less more, right? can be more. Yes, that less can be more. I mean, like, why do you think people still play GSCOU? There's not like as much moveset depth as one might want, but still the actual- Well, things get optimized in different ways when you take away, when there's no, like the only items leftovers and there's no EVs, that does, okay, there's less optimization to be had in the team building in the sense, but what about in the, like, the lines and the decision making? Those can go insanely complex in Gen 2 in particular. It's one of the most yeah, complex I, metagames despite having li very limited options. It's I'm interesting so to think about it where you can optimize anything. You can optimize literally yeah. anything, and it doesn't matter how many options you have or don't have. There's games that are so simple that they get solved, like tic-tac-toe or some crap, but if you've got enough options, there'll be a way. You know, Gen 3 goes in circles where the current metagame looks so different to last year and the year before. The other thing about Gen 2 OU is that the way that I put it, if you took an expert in every single generation of OU, right, if you... If you, and you had someone that was like a casual in each of those generations play them. I would put my money on the person playing the Gen 2 OU expert to have the least, like the least viable chance to win that game. I feel like the level of just uh, the depth, the master level of Gen 2 OU, way more intimidating and like strong than any other generation. I agree, and the people who still play Gen 2, some of them are just like M-Dragon Fear Conflict, these kinds of people. They're kind of on another level of uh, like fundamental understanding of the game. A total other level, because like they're able to, they understand Pokemon on this level. It's not even about like the moves anymore. It's not even about like the, the new Pokemon anymore. It's about like specific interactions and like moving your pieces. And like, I just think that's really, really interesting in that sense. There's something like really great about that. And like, I feel like that is found in top level play in a lot of old generations of OU um, and probably in newer generations, but it gets clouded by like the fact that they're just popular. Gen 2 is one where 
I agree it has like some of the most depth ever, but it's also a hard sell for the average Joe because it's it's a little bit hard to understand on the like just watching it on the surface. I think Gen 3 has the great balance where it has that depth, but it's also easy to follow what's happening. And there's like flashy stuff that's exciting, kind of like Melee. Uh, yeah. Where, you know, there's like mechanics like focus punch and uh, when someone makes an epic yeah. play, it's more obvious. Gen 2 is more slow progress. And as much as Big BigKC wants to say it's like not a slow metagame, it, it is compared to other OUs. There is offense in it, of course. There's like, you have to break through and win with like Curse Lax and Nido King and these mines. But it is kind of harder to visually understand. If you're not as into Pokemon, it's hard to understand who's winning sometimes. And it really is. It is. And I think the other thing too, is that I remember like, you know, kind of people talk about the Gen 3 Renaissance, which like, you know, you're like the main person who has kind of contributed to this like Gen 3 Renaissance. You got other YouTubers like, you know, me, of course, in like a different way. And like, you know, got like, I'm a Blissey doing other Gen, like there's a lot of people doing this, not even just competitive Gen 3, but just Gen, the Generation 3 in general. And I've always like wondered, you know, like Gen 1 has like that YouTube base. You got like Big Yellow, you got Plague Von Karma, you got a, a Reverend and like that kind of thing. Gen 3 ha definitely has a YouTube thing now. And I've always kind of wondered, like, I wonder if Gen 2 will ever get some sort of like Renaissance. And a lot of people in my chat seem to think that it won't, like that it just, like it won't, it won't just because, you know, it's not, you know, it doesn't have the it quality could. of being like the first ever and it's not visually flashy like Gen 3. I feel like it just might need someone that gives it a new light. Like it needs a, it needs a Jim Cool. It needs like a, some like, or like it needs something like that. And I don't know when that'll come, but I think it would be cool if it ever happened. I don't know. What do you, th what do you think about that? I think that there could be a way to make it interesting, at least in video form. As for converting people to becoming players, that's a bit harder because it's like yeah. a difficult game and maybe it's not as immediately fun or interesting as something like Gen 3 where you can be a bit goofy in Gen 3 and experiment with weirdo stuff. And it's not like you're going to win consistently, but you can at least cook stuff up and like sometimes it'll work. That's fun in its own right. Gen 3 has more ways you can play it where someone like Pokology just messes around, someone like ABR is optimizing. I talked about this in my Iceberg video where there's like a spectrum of, you know, goofiness to seriousness. And Gen 3, you have like everything along the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Gen 2 is a bit, yep. you can be, you can be creative in Gen 2 for sure in team building. Like, but I think in Gen 2, the emphasis is less on team building and more on uh, patience and metagame awareness and understanding yeah you know not like sick doubles or like you know stuff like that but like you yeah. can i mean you can do doubles you could make plays here and there but it's it's not as emphasized yeah i'm with you i don't know because because there really isn't from what i know like even just like a like a gen 2 youtuber but well, I, there was that video about it. mill tank in gen 2 that did well by i think freeze eye that there's sometimes like yeah. cool stuff metagame developments you could talk about. You know what I mean? Like Freeze Eye does a lot of definitely not associated with like Gen 2. Even BKC isn't really hyper associated with Gen 2. It's just interesting that I feel like, and maybe it's just me not knowing, but like even generations like four and five, I don't, in my head, I don't really think of any like big YouTuber that is exclusively or mainly focused on the lore or like anything regarding those specific For generations. Gen 4, I you think you I could mean? say BKC is, even though he, he does a lot of gens, I think Gen 4 is like his best gen. And, uh, no, I'm, yeah. He's got videos about like the rise of Clefable and like Nido Queen and all these cool stuff in Gen 4. Yeah, Gen 4. But he does talk about cup. every Gen, you're right. He, but I, yeah. I, in my head, I think of him as a Gen 4 guy. There is a guy called Cherry Bong, who's, yep, I think Gen he's a really 2. cool YouTuber. I think his channel deserves more attention. It's a really cool channel. He had this video about Pillar Swine. Yeah. Which was I awesome. I watch his videos to go to sleep sometimes. Yeah. He's the only Gen 2 YouTuber. And I know, like, uh, I know Fear uploaded like uh two or three videos on like uh some of his sbl games which is really cool to see him like talk about his different thought processes thought processes and stuff kind of like if you've ever seen a uh, the linear curves sbl analysis channel oh yeah or, i like, should check that out I if you had a youtube channel oh, my, my favorite God, players yeah. I don't think conflict has ever made videos you know that conflict would uh, watch my streams a lot like he would like he would like oh, give yeah. his ideas on like yeah, it was funny. Conflict destroyed me when I played him in Gen 4 OU in the Callus Crew Challenge. Mm, yeah. And I've never been more destroyed in my life. That was <laughs> that was embarrassing. He made me feel like I've never played the game in my life. <laughs> it's what you said, like small, big fish in a small pond or whatever. Going to a Smash yeah. tournament, playing Ganondorf. Like, those are the moments that I like. Like, I remember a couple of years ago, I got really into table tennis randomly. And I went to this, like, table tennis club in the city. And, like, I got my... I got absolutely destroyed 
But I was at the same time, I was like, wait, I love this because I know that like maybe at some point you won't destroy me like as hard. Like if I, I like the fact that I had a zero chance of winning right away because it means that you have to put in work to be good at this. I love table tennis actually. I always watch it at the Olympics. On the topic of like uh, random obscure niche things, you ever just watch like some obscure Olympic sport you never heard of? And there's just people who have trained their whole lives for like Olympic rock climbing or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was watching, like I watched the whole saga of like women's sports climbing at the Olympics. Really? I watched the whole thing and it was like fascinating. They got to do this like little obstacle course of climbing in a certain amount of time. Wow. And it looked what really hard. Olympic, yeah. That's interesting. One of the best Olympic things I've ever watched was the finals for women's doubles Batman. It was between, I believe, South Korea and Japan. And it was unreal. Like the amount of passion from both of these teams, the intensity, like it was some of the best sports that I have ever watched, hands down. It was like, it was electric and it was Batman. And it was so just Batman, like, it's wow. cool. It's a cool sport yeah, as well. It is. It was just like, wow, this yeah, is I like. I follow a lot of sports. Maybe I should. But I, I always like the Olympics. That's the one thing I like. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of variety. I guess I don't like um, following one sport long term and having insane knowledge of it. But when you just randomly tune into some sport you never heard of, the Winter Olympics is epic where you got like bobsledding and. <laughs> yeah. It's like, geez. Yeah, or like luge. <laughs> Those are crazy. They look like dangerous too. With bobsledding and stuff, it's like, oh, okay, you just like kind of sit in that bobsled and let it do its things. But no, you're like making these like micro adjustments with your body. I think I remember like watching a video that kind of like went in depth about USA's like main female bobsledder and like how she trains and like what she does. And it's like, I mean, she's like full on weightlifting. Like she's like about to like full on sport. And like, I know it's not, but like, you know, you don't really like associate it with like other sports that like you'd want to do like strength training for, right? Like football, soccer, I mean, well, American football and then soccer, like basketball, you know, like that kind of stuff. And like, she's like out here like doing crazy reps in the gym and she's a bobsledder. Like that's so sick. It is. It's interesting how it's people of certain body types and like th there's a certain optimal weight for certain sports where one of my buddies was really into arm wrestling competitive arm wrestling and he was trained specifically <laughs> oh, no for it wow and it was, it's this whole thing this whole underground world of competitive arm wrestling yeah and this just ties back to like the greatness of YouTube, honestly, of like <laughs> these worlds, right? Like it is just like so a something I want to do is make um maybe in the future branch out from Pokemon and make videos about these weird niche competitive communities like yeah because it's it's really interesting arcade. to me arcade arcades I literally gave you that idea there you go Ar I mean like arcade machine. sometimes I randomly will look up uh there's people who still play competitive Warcraft 3 to this day and I just <laughs> randomly look that up yeah. sometimes like how's that going how are those guys doing like the 800 view YouTube video yeah but community. it's just like this whole it's like Warcraft 3 league or something it, this little corner of the world yeah like i remember the other day i was watching like air hockey like that competitive world that oh yeah that's like, that's cool i never knew there was competitive air i guess of course it's there just is like garage not even garage it's just like like a little facility and stuff like that but it's just kind of cool like wow there's like a a small air hockey community and the commentators are like commentating like you know oh yeah he's really good at this and that or like nice like and it's just like wow like this is just like i'm trash at so air hockey cool. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm okay at air hockey. I really like a bubble hockey, but that's- What's, what's that? A little bit. You know, like foosball, you know foosball where like you twist it and there's like yeah, a yeah. little soccer player. So bubble hockey is like the same kind of like those sticks back and forth, but when you twist it, it's a hockey person with a stick and they move their stick. So like you can go forward and back and move your stick and it's a little puck and it's in like a plastic bubble so that like if you hit the puck and it ricochets up, it just kind of like bounces off the bubble. That sounds epic. Yeah, it's really, it is, it is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I played it at like the arcade a couple days ago. I was like, yeah, bubble hockey is cool. And I was like, I w and I, I haven't looked it up, but yeah, like competitive bubble hockey has got to go crazy. I mean, we could talk about this for, did you say you have somewhere to be? I do in five minutes. I do admittedly. I was just, I was just about to discreetly type. <laughs> All right, yeah, I was just looking at the time, and I was like, we've been going for a while here. The fridge has been The running. fridge is running. Is your refrigerator running? Yes. Well, thank you so much for coming. Great discussion. Great chat. Yes, this was fun. I'd be happy to have you back if you'll if you'll come. It's a bit annoying with the time zone difference. Some want some people want us to co-commentate Gen three too, but it's hard to line that up. 
But whenever we have the opportunity to chat and collab, it's always great. So thank yes, you so much. I'm definitely down to come back on the uh, the fridge. Thank you, folks, for watching this far. Freddy Fridge. Freddy Fridge is about to make a splash. <laughs> <laughs> He's about to be one of the premier characters premier, of all time. The, the luxury line of fridges, Freddy Fridge. That's the future. All right. Lots of accessories. See you, folks.